Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, bear with me. I'm, uh, this is my first time with the Britney Spears style microphone, so uh, it should in theory be better, but um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I've, I've pre-gloved because there's nothing more awkward than trying to get on a pair of nitrile rubber gloves in front of a few hundred people. Um, and of course, because we have the real star of the show, this item. Um, so I suppose I should start with uh, a bit of a story. I started here in 2009, that's a, a long time ago, frighteningly long time ago, quite a few more gray hairs on my head since then. And looking amongst the collection, um, I, I think I've said before when, when I've written about this thing that I've, I found it in, in a back room. I think I didn't mean to say I discovered it. It had been catalogued. The Ministry of Defense Pattern Room, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's a predecessor collection to ours. They had collected this thing. And the previous uh, the custodians of that, of that collection, I guess to them it was a curiosity. They weren't too interested. So it was in a back room. And as I was, I was there looking at something else, and I saw this absolutely insane, essentially blunderbuss-looking thing. And I just, I was immediately drawn to it for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. And it is a bit steampunk. I mean, not technically, because it's not like, it uh, doesn't project lasers or anything. And there's no actual steam involved. However, it's definitely a contraption. It's an Edwardian contraption. Um, I'm very sure that some of you have spotted the, the back end is, well, what is the back end? I'd be very disappointed if we hadn't managed to answer that one. Yes, so. Um, the back end is pretty straightforward. So, uh, this is a bit of a mullet of a gun. Uh, <laughs> sort of business in front, more business in the back. No, it doesn't really work. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that somehow don't know, the Martini Henry rifle, standard uh, service rifle of the British Army for, well, front line, not for that long, because the technology was moving so fast. But very straightforward. So, opens up. Shove in a great big milk bottle size <laughs> cartridge, 450 caliber. Um, pretty, pretty potent for, for the time. But in this case, it's just a blank cartridge because the really interesting stuff is happening at this end. And I guess there I need to um, dial it back a little bit and talk about. If we can just throw up our first image, that's convenient. There we go. Uh, this is from our archive. We don't have a huge amount of photos in our archive, but we do have some. It's actually a stereoscopic um, image, two of them side by side. We've cropped it. So if you have a viewer, you can see this guy in 3D and all the other photos. Anyway, why, why he's there is that we have a, a number 24 rifle grenade. Sorry, number 23 rifle grenade sticking out the end of an SMLE, a number one rifle. That's on a brass rod that goes down the bore, if you're not familiar with these things. So this, the idea here, this is the First World War, of course. Uh, almost right away, in 1914, um, the authorities realized that you need something. Well, every, people have essentially gone to ground. They've dug in both sides. Stalemates already happened, late 1914. And it's suddenly very hard to hit people in trenches. So you can run up to a trench or into a trench and bowl in a hand grenade, but reach is really important. and so. I think what they said that a, a novice could throw a hand grenade something like 20 yards. An expert was expected to throw it something like 45 yards, which I definitely couldn't, but uh, with the, the old cricket, cricket throw. So how do you reach, probably a German, in, in a trench at some distance away? Well, the rod grenade was, or, or the cup uh, launch grenade was, uh, they were the two options. So a rod down the barrel and a cylinder fragmentations, um, cylinder full of explosives on the end of it. Or they did, what we ended up with, spoiler alert for this thing, is a cup containing essentially a Mills bomb, and that would get punted out. And those would reach out to allegedly 200 yards. So from a novice throw to uh, a grenade launcher, you know, massive, massive increase in range. But how do you aim these things? Well, if you've seen, you've, his setup was a bipod attached to the rifle. That's, that's unusual. Typically, it would just be braced upside down into the ground, but in the ground. Because if you don't do that, you're going to break your shoulder. 
the amount of mass being punted off the end of the gun, try and fire it from the shoulder. You know, the movies mislead us because everything's fired with blanks. Um, recoil is a thing. And the recoil of a, you know, a few pounds of metal and explosives flying off the end of your gun is bad news. So you brace it into the ground. If you look at photos of World War II, like Home Guard guys, there's a great one on the IWM, Imperial War Museum collection site. There were various methods for bracing it into the ground behind you, so casually reclining on <laughs> against the bank, a convenient bank. Not sure how practical that is when you've got a, a German tank approaching, because by this point, rifle grenades are really mainly for killing tank. Well, I say killing tanks, annoying tanks with. So that's, that's the background to this. We, we've already uh, we've reintroduced hand grenades, because they were not a thing, at the really, at the beginning of the war. We have come up with a way to project them off a gun, but you can't shoulder fire them, so you can't really properly aim them. You're, you're looking at punting them into the vague area of, of the enemy. Uh, they do develop sighting systems later, but again, you've got to awkwardly lie so that the butt is braced against the, you know, the trench wall or whatever. So. This was the other potential option. Come up with a system that will allow you to shoot a grenade from the, from the shoulder. Now, some of you who are more familiar with the modern period um, will be thinking, well, why didn't they just create an M79 grenade launcher? You know, clunk, bloop, <laughs> away it goes. Well, they hadn't invented them yet, funnily enough. <laughs> However, a couple of guys, and the other one is for another day, because. But almost the same time, two different guys invent shoulder fire grenade launchers. I guess it's like buses, you know, two come along at once. <laughs> so we can actually, and this is what I had to do when I researched this, we can read the object but explain how it works, and we can also read the markings. Now, weirdly, I don't know if you can see this on camera, but these markings are upside down. I, and I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why they're upside down. Just in case they're a bit hard to see, it says Blanche, and then there's a weirdly stylized hyphen. It's more like, it's, in fact, what it is is a letter I from some sort of stamp kit that's been rotated to act as a hyphen. Chevalier system. So that gave, gave me my initial bit of jump off point for the research. Who are Blanche? Who are Chevalier? Uh, so Herbert John Blanche is of the John Blanche Limited Gun Company. Um, set up in the late 18th century, very famous, very capable, mainly made sporting guns and guns for civilians, um, eminently capable of producing this bit and sticking it onto this bit. So that's the Blanche bit of the name. Um, Chevalier is where it gets very interesting. Not that John Blanche isn't interesting, but Chevalier is Arnold Louis Chevalier, and he is Swiss, or, or half Swiss, half British. His mother was British, but they were living in Switzerland. And he um, immigrated to Britain end of the 19th century, and is naturalized a British citizen in 1896. And he is actually quite prolific. Um, he's not a sort of John Browning, he doesn't have huge success, but he has at least 20 unique patents, all to do with firearms, either new systems or you know, new sighting systems, that kind of thing. Published books, he published articles. He and I have both published articles in the Field magazine, <laughs> weirdly, like 100 plus years apart. Um, so I was oddly pleased by that, but anyway. <laughs> no, I think good footsteps to follow in. Um, so they're, they're the... You know, firearms get named in different ways. In this case, it's, it's the maker and the designer. Smash them together, you get the, the Blanche Chevalier gren uh, Grenade Discharger is its formal name, which I also love and is also very steampunk and Edwardian. Um, and also it's called a bomb thrower. Um, I've got an image I'm going to show you later that I found in the magazine Arms and Explosives, which sounds like my sort of magazine. Um, I wasn't familiar with it before, I don't think. We don't seem to have copies in the archive. Anyway, they called it a bomb thrower. That's not unusual. Grenades were, were, were typically called bombs in the First World War time frame, and there were various more artillery ways of fire, throwing them that make more sense, if you like. Something handheld was typically called a discharger or a projector. Projector is the later British term. We can call it a launcher. I don't mind. 
However, there's more, there's more on this object. So again, let's see if we can catch, catch this. Um, the longer we can look, the easier it is. There we go. Just about the lighting. It's so shiny, isn't it? Let me read it for you. It's very heavy as well, as you can probably tell. So, Enever, E-N-E-V-E-R, which is a name, another not hyphen, and Chevalier again. So our designer is involved. And it's shorthand, but it's Patent Automatic Small Arms Company Limited. PT Automatic S-A-C-Y-L-D. So this is great. This gave me all the clues I needed to start doing some desktop research to, to figure out who these guys were. Already told you about Blanche and Chevalier. Who the heck is Enova? Well, he's absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> would you like to hear about him first, or would you like to learn how this works? It's up to you. I don't know. Let, let's do the math. Let's, let's get the people out of the way first. So, Enova, wow, what a guy. <laughs> Absolutely astonishing story. Um, there's a, the, probably the best source on this, if anyone's interested afterwards, there, there's a newspaper article that we can, uh, we can post online or something, and, and you can read the whole thing. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but this guy was what they called at the period a company monger. It's a weird term, but it was, it was a very live issue, in, I believe from like the 18... 60s onwards, initially with railways and transportation investments, uh, like, like essentially like moths to a flame or, or um, I don't know, vultures to a carcass or something, depending on the, how good the company was doing. These guys would pop up and offer investments to, to some. He offered investment to, to Chevalier. Um, but they would also own all these companies that didn't actually ever do any business. Or, or if they did business, it was very, very, very minor. So this guy was Edwin Alexander Enova. He was also uh, based overseas, well, he was born overseas. He was British Indian, um, or Indian British. He was a white Briton <laughs> in terms of uh, ethnicity, um, born and bred in, in India, part of, obviously part of the whole imperial setup. And came, he also came over. So he, um, Chevalier was born in 1878, just to give you an idea of how old these guys are, around about 1915 when this is being worked on, and Enova was born in 1872, so they're roughly the same generation. They both come from overseas, um, Enova coming from India, and he arrives um, early 19, very early 1900s, or at least he's around by then. He's a super shady guy, so <laughs> some of the details of his story are a little bit hard to pin down. Anyway, he is not mentioned on the patent for this thing, um, which is curious, because he is mentioned on a subsequent patent. But this company that was set up is one of Enova's many companies. So the, the Enova Chevalier Automatic Small Arms Company Limited, patent, I missed a word out, <laughs> was one of this guy's companies. But what his stock in trade, as it were, was not... There was a second wave of these um, fly-by-night company mongers, as they were known, in this period, 1880s, 1890s, onwards to, I guess, about 1920. And they were investing in well, automotive stuff, um, but, but mainly uh, mining, um, various overseas operations, extracting mineral wealth, that kind of thing. And what uh, Enova would do, among other things, he, pre he preyed upon um, uh, wealthy widows. So it's a bit of a, I picture him as a sort of dirty, rotten scoundrel type uh, character, for those of you who are old enough like me to, to watch that. Uh, but he also preyed upon military veterans, army officers who had a sort of, not bad pension from the armed forces, but weren't necessarily hugely well off. And he would take their money and I'd either give them a bit, of, a bit of initial investment if it was a company they were trying to set up and then never anything else, and then sell the shares, keep all the money, use the existence of the company as a bankruptcy cover, essentially, so that only the company was liable for the bankruptcy result, not him. Although having said, this was a common form of scam, apparently, until the laws were all tightened up. But he did get <laughs> declared bankrupt. Four times. So he was, he was sued 
and prosecuted as early as 1912 and 1913. He was declared bankrupt in 1918, again in 1920, again in 1922. I think I, I think I've miscounted because he then gets sued a final time in 1940. Uh, sorry, sorry, get, gets declared bankrupt rather for. for Another occasion in 1940. Huge swathe of time, and they, they, the authorities don't seem to be able to fully deal with this guy. But he is jailed twice for this. Um, first time is 1923. They put him away for three years, and that's for selling fake investment shares in Chinese mines. He would, he would make out that he, was, he, you know, he had all the contacts. He, he knew the, the East. He was from there, and he had all these contacts. And then he would go and use the money on wild parties at his um, Knightsbridge flat. It's just, it's just astonishing. He moved around all the time as well. He had like six different addresses within a few years. Absolutely astonishing. Real moustache twirling kind of villain. Um, in fact, uh, an incredible quote from the 1923 court, uh, court case. He, he juggles with money as easily as, the, as, as does the flirt with the hearts of men was what the judge said <laughs> at his trial, which is incredible. The, newspaper, the main newspaper article that gives most of these details, and I've been harvesting others since I wrote the initial article for Arms and Armour, very nearly 10 years ago, um, they, they used some choice language as well. They called him a, a dapper little rogue. They, <laughs> they called him a monocled rogue. Called him a rogue again. Um, all, sort, all sorts of uh, derisive language aimed at this chap. So, what's the specific relationship? Well, that's where the story falls slightly flat because we don't have any juicy details of the relationship. When they ba bashed in the doors of this guy's office slash luxury flat that he had an escape route out the back of, by the way, so that wh when the wealthy widows came knocking on the door, he could scarper out the back. Uh, when they came knocking, there was a plaque on the, d on the door of several of these bogus companies that didn't really exist, this one wasn't, wasn't featured. Um, it seems like they severed ties with this guy, uh, Blanche and Chevalier, Chevalier in particular, relatively early on, um, either because they realized what a fly-by-night he was, or they just weren't getting that any more investment. They maybe got an initial pot of money to make this, and one other, which I'll show you a picture of in a bit. So we, we you know, here at the Royal Armouries, we love uh, we love technology, but we also love the historical stories, and the the two together, I just think, are, this is this is this is my favourite object for that level of detail of social history, and you know, even even touching on um, you know, imperial history and all, all sorts of other aspects as well. The guy, the guy is is fascinating. Um, oh, he's, sorry, he's jailed again. <laughs> so. After his 1922 bankruptcy, he goes to jail for three years. After his 1940 bankruptcy, he goes to jail for another six. And that's for, again, selling you know, for fraudulent investment stuff. So the law is tightening up all the time. And that's sort of the last gasp of these things. I managed to track him down only recently as to where he ended up. So he, he, by 1930, he had scarpered out his, out his fire escape, or whatever it was, secret tunnel, um, to South Africa. He'd married a, a poor, unfortunate woman called Wilhelmina. Um, who, so I, I tracked her down online through the genealogy type searches. So Wilhelmina Enova, she's uh, Dutch Boer extraction, and they he, they have five children. I don't know in what space of time, but by 1940 he's back in London running scams, and she's not there. She stays there. She lived to at least a hundred. I found an article from a local newspaper in South Africa, Cape Town, where um, she's still alive at 100, and there's a picture of her. Just astonishing to look at a picture of this woman that was married to this absolute maniac criminal that I'm researching. It's connections like that are, uh, yeah, well, they're as good as getting hands on the real thing. That's kind of my point. And I think that's uh, enough from him for now. But. I can't resist telling you ahead of time, I found a photo of him. So <laughs> and that's actually, well, it's worth saying that because we don't have any photo. I mean, John Blanche, I, I, you could probably, we could probably find a picture of him. But the key player here, Chevalier, no photo exists that I can find, unfortunately. 
Uh, if you're interested, have a look on Google Patents and or Espasnet, the European patent website. Search on Chevalier and you will find his various patents, which include some very Chagrin-like inertia operating systems. This is where it gets a bit techy. Uh, I'm sure I'm amongst friends <laughs> in that respect. But So inertia, in other words, something stays still, something else moves to affect the reloading of the gun. Well, it's not going to reload this, is it? This, this is muzzle loading. You have to put a bomb in the front of this. Um, and it isn't going to magically reload the back end either, because it's a martini, and you have to open it up, shove in a cartridge, and close it up. So what, if I'm telling you, which I am, <laughs> that Chevalier is using his inertia system on this, how on earth is he doing that? Well, if we throw up the next picture, and I'll stop waving this around for now. <laughs> I can start to hopefully explain how this works. Now, I, I, full, full disclosure, I wrote a, a full peer-reviewed article on this thing 10 years ago. I wrote a, a shorter version for the firearm blog even, even longer ago. No, that was 10 years ago. The other one was slightly less, around the same time. <laughs> and I didn't actually figure it out properly. So I, I intuitively realized that this was a recoil dampening system. I think you can see that. Massive coil spring in there. There's then the Martini Henry barrel is cut off, so that extends. Wouldn't normally look down the front of the gun, but we have, we have checked this clear multiple times. And it is about, on this one, it's about roughly, not quite half. So you cut off your rifle barrel. That's giving you the motive, the, the propulsive, propulsive force from the blank cartridge. Definitely don't want to shoot a bulleted cartridge through this thing, by the way. That would be really bad. <laughs> and then on the front of it, sorry, could we have that back again? I was a bit too previous. Um, wait, can you see B? Item B right in the middle behind the grenade. That's, that's supposed to be a grenade. That looks like I drew it. Uh, <laughs> we're coming to that in a moment. That is. And there's mention of asbestos in the patent, and I had a moment of, oh, God, I didn't tell conservation that, no, this has no asbestos in it. Because that, that was meant to be added as an optional extra. Something you'll find if you study historical patents is they start listing, it's like a laundry list of things you could do with, with this design. But we haven't yet. Anyway, so that is a sliding piston. I thought it was a platform. I thought it worked like a Piat launcher. The Piat launcher is essentially a giant spring that is there to absorb the recoil of the massive bomb that you fire off the, off the projector. And then the great big firing pin recocks against that strong spring, preventing it from mashing your shoulder to a pulp and also recocking itself. That's how the Piat works. It's not a big spring that throws the bomb off. Um, I think Matt Moss is here somewhere. Check out his work on the Piat. It's great stuff. That's not... So that's not exactly how this works. In fact, I was messaging him frantically the other night about it because I realized I hadn't actually got to the bottom of it. So this is new information that you're getting here. It is not a platform that springs back because how could it spring back? The barrel's in the way. The Martini Henry barrel is in the way of the platform. So I'm scratching my head thinking, is this just a really bad patent drawing? So if we throw up the next image, remember the grenade off. Cover that in a moment. So there's the coil spring. This is an x-ray of our gun. Seems like a logical thing to do. There's a, uh, if you go on our collections online uh, website, there's a slightly wider shot version of this that gives you, it doesn't give you much more. You can see these latches here, which I'll cover in a moment. But otherwise, it's just this. So there's that Martini Henry 45 caliber barrel. There's the great big uh, piston. You can see the ring there where you would put something. This is how we know it doesn't have asbestos in it. Um, you can see the, 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 it's like a piston ring. On a, if you're familiar, familiar with car engine pistons or the piston on the front of an AK rifle that works the mechanism, they have rings around them and, well, it's supposed to work the same way. So it's not, the, the platform definitely recoils against the spring, but what's it doing? How is it getting past that barrel? Well, the answer that took me probably an embarrassingly long several hours to figure out, is that the whole back end of this gun recoils out of itself. 
Does that make sense? <laughs> so, so the platform the, the, that sits under the grenade is about here, or as it was in the drawing. The barrel is fixed to it, so it's on the end, permanently attached. This should slide. I did try when I first, when I had a tearful reunion with this behind the scenes earlier, I was going, don't want to break it. I think it would break me first, to be fair. But sadly, no, it does not slide anymore, not without a bit of wood and a big hammer, which we're very unlikely to attempt. But it's, that's how it's supposed to work. So there is, in fact, a separate, I'll try and show you that. There is a, this is a separate piece attached to the action. The whole little, little, relatively little barrel comes sliding out the back of the gun. The whole assembly would then effectively bottom out. So the spring is at full compression. It's quite a stout spring in there, as I'm sure you saw from the drawing, and well, more so from the x-ray. So it would come to, a, come to a stop. The gun has concertinaed out. And then once the bomb has gone down range and you're questioning your life choices, it concertinas back together again. Absolutely insane, um, but very clever. Because how else are you going to soak up that tremendous recoil to allow you to fire this from the shoulder? That's the only, the only way you can do it is by absorbing the recoil. The M79 does it in a, using the ammunition, which was way ahead of what these guys were doing. So to that end, we also have a, a flip-up rear sight, which is unmarked. That's not unusual for a prototype. In fact, I should probably say it's even possible that this was never fired because, well, we, I certainly can't figure out what sort of grenade they might have used in this. Nothing in the inventory at the time fits, um, literally fits, <laughs> and doesn't match that drawing either, that very vague drawing. Behind that, uh, I don't know if you noticed, was a wooden, well, you can't tell it's wooden, it's a drawing, but there's meant to be a sabo to stop all the gas of firing from blowing past. So the little egg-shaped grenade fits in that cup, essentially, and is loaded down the front. Of course, you wouldn't ever want to preload the blank cartridge because then you've got an extremely dangerous weapon on your hands, and there's no manual safety catch on the Martini either. So we're already into some problems with the design. Um, the mechanism, as I've described it, concertinaing apart, well, you're ho I'm holding this bit with my right hand, I'm holding this bit with my left hand. It's, <laughs> it's like a trombone. Um, not, not conducive to accuracy. You know, don't fancy that much. Uh, so you've got the ability to fire it from the shoulder. That's going to increase accuracy a lot. You have a sighting system. I imagine, based on this, that there would have been a slider for different ranges. Uh, that's probably better than the, if you've seen the, the cup, uh, cup launcher they went with, the number one Mark one, it's a rotating ring, and even in the instructions it says a quarter turn for 110 yards, or it's not quite right, but it goes from 80 yards up to um, the full 200 based on some very vague settings. Um, so potentially better than that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great idea, it's ahead of its time, but I'm not sure that it was viable. Let's put it that way. And certainly, we don't see it go anywhere. Um, there's, no, there's no trials <laughs> that, that we can find any evidence of. Um, there are only two examples that we know were made. Uh, as ever, it would be lo lovely to get more information. But S Let's just cover off the, a few details I've missed. So I briefly pointed at, sorry, keep going that way, um, these latches. You can see those moves, and if I turn it that way, see how that works? Pinched together. Those are clearly for retaining, I don't know if it would be the sabo or the grenade, but it's, it certainly doesn't fit any grenade that we're aware of. And then the only other accommodation for the actual projectile is this cover. Is it for a fly-off lever for a grenade? Who knows? So if we could just have the, I think, the last picture. Here's the man. <laughs> I wanted to save him to finish on, because he just, 
I just couldn't believe it. This was literally the other night, thinking, I hope, I wonder, is there anything I can add for anyone who's managed to find the article and has read it? And up pops this guy. I just could not believe it. <laughs> so pleased to find it. And to, um, immediately spotted the monocle, and the phrase monocled rogue, you know, popped into my head from that newspaper article. Absolutely astonishing. And there he is with the gun. I then got extra excited, thinking that it was this gun. It's not this gun. I don't know if you can see the differences, but the barrel is longer, it's slimmer, the sight is way taller, and there are a few other details that are different as well. But on the, I was then still quite happy because it meant that we knew they'd made two. And then had a moment of, oh, I should probably check that it's the right guy. I thought, monocles weren't that common um, by 19. 15, 16, so this is from December 1916, so the, the date of 1916 is, is correct for this information. So, I've probably missed some stuff, but you know, there is an article you can dig out on that. Um, this normally lives up on floor three in our First World War display where I shamelessly crowbarred it in. Um, hey, it's relevant, it's the, it, they were trying to solve the problem of, the tre of trench warfare from a certain angle, so yeah, you can get up close to it behind glass, Sadly, but yeah, that's, that's how we have to do things uh, up there. Uh, that's probably it. I probably won't find out anything more about this story, but it's a lot more than we know about most of, of any historical uh, collection. So I'll stop rambling. Um, hopefully, there are some questions, um, and that there will be people with microphones and things as well. So I hope you enjoyed that bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank, thank you all for your attention. That was absolutely fascinating, Jonathan. Um, I have never seen the picture of the monocled rogue. I couldn't believe. I think we spoke last week and there was no picture of the monocled rogue. We weren't doing that for suspense. That's I thought of you <laughs> <laughs> about third. <laughs> I thought, monocle, big gun. Jack will love this. <laughs> I did. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, we're going to go into a Q&A session, guys. So um, there are some people with microphones going around. So if you do have a burning question for Jonathan, whether it's about the Blanche Chevalier, whether it's about himself or just the topic of arms and armor, if I could ask you to keep your questions as precise and short as possible, because we are probably going to have a lot of people to get through. Um, and uh, we will go from there. So please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, so if we go for this gentleman at the front here, next to the lady with the amazing hat. <laughs> My question might not be relevant, but I want to know, as a fellow Jonathan who goes by John, why Jonathan and not John? Ah, um, I do actually have a, a quick answer to that. Jack will be pleased to hear. <laughs> so I, I, I started going by John relatively young, um, but then when I entered the world of work, uh, my boss at Imperial War Museum Duxford, John Delaney, um, great guy, was called John. And so whenever someone said, John, so I, st I thought, well, do you know what? I don't, I don't dislike my first name, it's just a little bit unwieldy, so that will be my professional name, because <laughs> it's also my name. <laughs> uh, the gentleman with the glasses. Hi, John, I was just wondering, the obvious answer is, you know, First World War, why it's not based on a Lee Enfield. Is there any information <laughs> on that? <laughs> That's a very good question, and one I probably can't give a, a very coherent answer to. Except that, I, I mean, this is speculation. So I have, it's something that has occurred to me. The advantage, I suppose, of a martini action is it's, it prevents you from having a live round in a magazine, uh, from getting sort of out of sorts with whether you've got a grenade loaded. Uh, and how, have I got five cartridges and no grenades? Or, and they were very conscious at the time that soldiers were not necessarily going to be of a certain training level. Like, look at the magazine cutoff thing. I mean, admittedly, very quickly in 1914, that becomes a safety device, and they're not, say they're not saying they don't trust the soldiers. But we are coming from a long tradition of you have a, a set of jobs to do, and we're not necessarily going to expect you to be able to manage a newfangled grenade launcher with a, five, with a 10 round magazine, or even a five round magazine. So that, that's my speculative answer on that. There's no obvious reason why you couldn't. 
it might be harder to sort of breach this thing up against the grenade launcher barrel assembly. The Martini does offer that very big flat base to the action body. But they didn't write it down, so we don't really know. Anybody from this side of the room? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, do, did the British Army use uh, the Martini to create any kind of projector or launcher like how the French used the Graf to make, um, I think they were grenade launchers, but I think they might have been flare projectors as well. Um, did we do the sim a similar thing or was it just this contraption? <laughs> contraption is the right <laughs> word. Uh, great question. Um, no. <laughs> it, despite the obvious thing to do, but I suppose there's no patent and no money in it, is to marry up a Martini-type rifle, if, if, if for whatever reason you think that's appropriate, it, it, there was a reason they did go with the Lee-Enfield, with a simple cup launcher, and maybe it's cut down this sort of size and format, and you carry it as a grenadier. That, that's the sort of obvious way to do it, except that you've got to come up with a recoil dampening system, whatever you use, Martini or, or, or Enfield. Uh, but no, no, there's no, I've never come across anyone attempting to create a cup launcher. Because you might think maybe they were using Martini Metford or Enfields with cup launchers on them, because again, you, don't, you only need the one launching cartridge, so good use of spare Martinis, but no, not, not that we've ever come across. But never say never. Anybody from the middle? Uh, gentleman near the front. Sorry, Leanne. As far away as possible. I feel like I need a peaked cap. Um, is, there any, uh, is there any clue to the provenance of the martini? And might I also suggest that martinis you could get hold of, Enfields were all needed. Um, is there any clue to the provenance? Uh, the provenance of this particular uh, no, barrel of action? Of the rifle that it's based on. Good question. No. <laughs> I didn't speak too much about that. Um, just to fill in the detail on that, there's no provenance information, but there's some information on the action body, as you might imagine. It is not a military rifle. Action, it's, uh, the, it's Brendlin, it's a Brendlin martini. So it has the cross pennants and the B of the Brendlin company. It's something you could buy as a civilian, uh, well, still can, in fact. So cross pennants, B, martinis patents, and the, the sort of double M martini logo, sort of his patent logo, as it were, is on there as well, but that's it. It's, it's just like the military martini Henry, but it is not a military one. Uh, which stands to reason, this, these guys are not part of the military system, so they just they just bought one. Ah, I did check the serial number. So the serial number would suggest mid-1880s production. So it's a surplus martini that's lying around already by 1914, 15, when they're experimenting, and they chop it up and do unspeakable things to it. Um, <laughs> but I'm kind of glad they did. But no, unfortunately, um, I guess we could potentially find purchase ledgers that would, that would have a serial number and work out who it went to first, but I don't think that would help us very much with the overall story. But yeah, very open to suggestions like that, and good question. Uh, so we have a question from the live stream. It's from Morton, who is a good friend of the show. Sorry. Oh, yes. Hello, Morton. Sorry you can't be here. Um, so Morton asks whether uh, the Blanche Chevalier could be field stripped, or would this be purely for a court martial to kind of take it down? Ugh. Yeah, well, <laughs> needless to say, we didn't want to get into stripping stuff in a live audience situation <laughs> for a number of reasons, but also because it wouldn't really tell us very much. We have the x-ray, we have the drawings for this bit, and stripping the martini isn't going to help very much. You can strip down the martini action, of course you can, even I can do that. Um, <laughs> it's actually an incredibly well-designed uh, system. Stripping this, this is a tool room prototype. The main screw down the end of the platform, I don't actually know, know what that's going to do if we undo it, and it's chewed to heck as well. So that would be a challenge. We'd have to involve our conservation colleagues to, to pull that off. These screws around the grenade barrel that hold it on, those look like they've come out quite easily. So we could probably get the barrel off the, this uh, collar here. I don't know if you noticed, but in the patent drawing, the collar was sort of radius. It was much more obviously something that stayed still while the barrel went away from it and came back again. That's partly how I figured it out. <laughs> this doesn't have that. This just has a, what looks to be seized in place, a cylinder inside a cylinder. So, so yes, you could. 
Strip it, feel strip it, absolutely not. There'd be no need. You could clean the, the, the action bit very easily, uh, take the breach bolt out if you were, or the um, breach block, sorry, if you're an armorer. That's so, I could have just said no. <laughs> Morton, sorry, Morton. The answer is no. <laughs> uh, anybody from this side of the room? Gentleman right there, yeah. Um, when it comes to obscure firearms and firearms that never really went into the mainstream of production, what is your personal favorite and why? <laughs> well, at the moment, it's this again, <laughs> as it was about 10 years ago. Um, but I do bounce around. Um, a couple of us were talking about the, the crets earlier with the bicycle chains and the weird reciprocating barrel. That's well up there as well. Um, I have a thing for bull pups, so the, the SREM with the pump cocking grip, that's a, there, there are too many, but I think for the, for the sheer sort of social history <laughs> aspect of the story, this thing has to take it. That's it. Uh, we're back to the middle, and we will go, this person just here with a checkered shirt. Will you be doing an Ian McCullen and firing it in a future video? <laughs> so I didn't quite, didn't quite catch the last bit. I heard Ian's name. <laughs> oh, fire! Oh, good grief! No, I can give a definitive answer to that one, and unfortunately, it is no. <laughs> um, we would need a very good reason to fire the only one that exists. We, so we know they made two, but we also know that only this one exists. So if this were to blow up, and the chances of it blowing up with a great big bomb in it. I mean, even if, you went for, <laughs> even if you went for something inert, which you would, you know, it'd be like a small Nerf football or something, <laughs> or a can of beer, no. <laughs> Definitely not a can of beer. Oh, God, I've compounded the, uh, the sin there, but um, <laughs> we just can't afford to do it. Um, it'd be fascinating to do it, but then the value, the sort of academic value of, of the answer is, is perhaps questionable. We already know it failed. So I guess the, the, the research question would be, could it not have failed? And yes, I'd love to try that out. Uh, but the way to do that is to raise a huge load of money from somewhere, have a, have a replica made. You'd have to strip this down to do that, and then test that out. And then maybe put it in a rig on a field firing area with the army and shoot a grenade that you've also designed and made with lots of explosives out of it. I can't see any of that actually happening, unfortunately. But we'd love to, obviously we'd love to, but first and foremost, we don't want to damage these things. So we'll open a crowdfunding to have a replica made. Um, what have I done? <laughs> if anyone has a beer on them. Uh, the last time I said something like that, I ended up with a whole set of steel 3D printed parts. John, thank you, you know who you are, um, who sent them to us, and that was for the automatic Garand rifle. So in theory, we could now <laughs> put that back together and shoot that. And even that would need some very careful thought, because again, that's the only one that exists. Um, incidentally, the, I, I knew I'd forget to say something, the whole recoil thing and the concertina nonsense, they obviously weren't that confident it was going to take out enough recoil, because there's a thick rubber butt pad as well. It's gone hard over time, but it is there. Anybody from this side of the room? Up there, your hand went straight up. Hello. Ooh. Hopefully it's not a, a work of fiction, but in the Battlefield 1 video game, <laughs> you probably know where ah. this is going, <laughs> their method of launching a grenade is literally it's a crossbow with a metal cup that you put a grenade in and launch it that way. Is that, background, is that based on anything in real life, or is that just an invention of a video game? Uh, and who that's, actually that's, builded it? That's substantially correct. Yeah, I mean, if you've seen footage from conflict zones, like um, Libya, certainly, they, they did what the British Army didn't. They, they get sh things like shotguns, single shot rifles and shotguns, and they weld together simple metal cups that go on the end, and all you, you then get like a jam tin bomb with a fuse, an actual fizzing fuse on the end that you <laughs> light with a cigarette lighter, shove down the end, hope you remember to put a blank cartridge in your shotgun, and then you punt it in the direction of the enemy. And that's essentially what was done um, back in the, in the First World War but with proper engineering <laughs> and adjustable range. So yeah, that, that's entirely how you would do it. And all you can do is drop it down. There's no, there's no re fancy retention system. All you do is you, for the standard cup launcher, number one, mark one, which I think is what they use in that, you screw on a gas check, which is a 
plate that matches ish the diameter of the of the cup and that hunts the bomb off the end of the, the gun thank you for mentioning battlefield one because i forgot to mention that one of one of the highlights of my career that probably shouldn't be is <laughs> seeing that they put that this in the game based on the nonsense that i'd written about it so now i know how ian feels <laughs> forgotten about it. and they unfortunately get it wrong because i didn't explain how it worked properly so uh, it's probably a bit late now to fix it <laughs> They made up a grenade for that, by the way, that's like a cylinder with a, with a fuse on the end. That's not based, on, well, it might be based on a Japanese design, I think. Anyway. Sorry, Jack, going off piece. No, it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, back to the middle, uh, we've got someone right at the back, way over there. Are there any good asides to the SA80 story that you could cover in a future episode? Uh, well, uh, yeah, um, probably re stuff reprised from the book, because there's a lot in there, um, and I don't expect by any means people to go out and buy that, so we will definitely be revisiting some, some bits from that. The slight problem we have with what's this weapon is it's meant to be a guessing game, so when people request stuff, I have to kind of put it at the bottom of the list, and then hope people forget about it. <laughs> so, but yes, we're, we're going to be covering that. Um, we do have our series up in arms as well. It might involve some object movements, but um, I'm sure we could pull that up. So yes, we'll be covering that. And more, I will, I'm finding out stuff all the time. You know, you ne you're never right. It's just like, it's like science, but not as important. Um, <laughs> you realize over time that stuff's either not quite right or completely wrong, <laughs> hopefully not, or you just find whole new stuff like I've shown you here, like how this works and the guy that scammed the inventor um, there's bound to be stuff that comes up. And we're never getting away from bullpups or the SA-80. No, so. There is no escape from bullpups. Um, anybody on the left? Uh, let's go, person down here at the front. Oh, I love the t-shirt. Thank you. I didn't notice it before. <laughs> uh, what's the criteria for adding new pieces to the Royal Armouries collection? If I think it looks cool, I buy, no, not really. <laughs> not, not at all, in fact. Um, quite the opposite. So uh, I would have done that with this. But. So there, is, there are, in fact, two committees and several reams of paperwork required. So we obviously we have a hope fair bit of sway <laughs> in terms of recommending what we think is good. So it can be stuff donated by, by private individuals. Um, be amazed what's in people's attics still. Um, obviously more so on the antique side, but uh, not always. Auctions, dealers, uh, the police, obviously we, you know, Americans who visit the collection, researchers who visit the collection, I think, well, why, do, why does a British collection have so many guns? Well, it's part of the environment. You know, it's, it's, we have a very different attitude to, to firearms in this country, and so you have a lot of eggs in one basket. Um, so it's case by case, but we have a collections development policy that highlights a few specific areas. For example, Stuff used in crime. If we if we get offered stuff by the by the authorities that was used in a known crime, we won't necessarily be able to display it right away, but we will keep that for future displays in however many years when it's not too soon anymore. Um, so that's that's one um, area. If we are lacking stuff from a certain country, you, you get the idea. It's a, it's a fairly tedious document, but it's 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 like a shopping list, I suppose. But it, that reality does not care about your administration, so or, or bureaucracy. So stuff just pops up, and we take an assessment. I, I have a small team um, that, that work for me, and we have a bit of a confab, um, and we put it forward to the, the first committee. And usually, we get it. <laughs> Obviously, money is a big, <laughs> a big problem in various ways. So. Uh, so we have time for two more questions. So we'll take one from the middle. Um, let's go person kind of in the middle. This, yeah, keep that the, the, green. There's a green sleeve. Yeah, that that that, that sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned uh, Chevalier being a somewhat prolific designer. Does he have any other systems or designs you find particularly interesting from this period? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something I nearly went down a rabbit hole on, and then realized I needed to just read my own article on this before today is the whole series of recoil-operated firearms. So this, this company that's written on the side of this is not set up to, to create this gun. 
Um, as I say, Enever isn't even mentioned on the patent, where he is on two other patents, which are all to do with this recoil-operated rifle. So there are at least three distinct designs. They look a bit like a, a, a Chagrin with a big sliding breech block thing on top. So very much worth going down that rabbit hole and seeing what he, what he came up with, how it compares to the Chagrin, might it have been any good. Unfortunately, we don't have any examples, though, so it's difficult for us to cover part of this. But Not to say that I won't try and get my head around. Trying to figure out how things work just from the patent is a massive challenge, but quite a fun one if you're like me. <laughs> okay, one last question. Uh, we will go with the green T-shirt. So, based on where you found this and the nature of military procurement, what are the odds this is actually just effectively the mock-up model that they've submitted? Very interesting question. What I failed to tell you is where it actually came from. So there's, whilst there's no provenance on the rifle, from this gentleman's question over here, there's prov immediate provenance for this object. So this came to us not from MOD, but from the Bapti Hop House. Uh, started by Major Philip Bapti in, I think, 1919. Um, and then run by the Dinley family, who are wealthy collectors and, and dealers of, of weapons as well. So either Mark or Peter Dinley presumably collected this. Where he found it, we do not know. This is always the frustrating thing. Nobody writes down where they find things. Even when we, we have to research provenance to, to buy something, and we, we ring them up and they go, uh, can you tell us where you got it? Oh, uh, pff, I think it's probably uh, Pudsey Arms Fair, uh, maybe 30 years ago. And we just put that forward, and hopefully that's enough to satisfy um, that it's not in any way a problem. I'm not blaming them for that. You know, unless they deal with museums all the time, they're not going to know. So point is, it's from the civilian world already by the time we pick it up in the historical record. But I think you're probably right. Uh, we, know, we know two existed. I mean, it's not a model in the sense of a wooden model or one made out of brass or something. Well, brass might be more expensive, actually. But my, my feeling looking at this and thinking, we've no idea what the grenade was. There's no grenade in the picture. He's just... This could be a model, just, a, just, make, just one that would work if you fired it, but they're treating it as a, essentially as a model. I wouldn't call it a model, because it's a working firearm. But yeah, so I, I, think, I think you're right. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody, for all of your questions. Um, we are now going to say goodbye to Firearm, and we're going to say goodbye to Jonathan. So could I please ask you to put your hands together once more for... Jonathan Ferguson. And the Blanche Chevalier.